thank you everyone for attending today's Computer Aided Technology Webinar. Uh, today I'm going to show you how to work with what I think is a really cool simulation tool, and that's topology studies. Uh, I've previously given this presentation to several SOLIDWORKS user groups in Kentucky and Indiana, uh, but most recently I updated it and presented this content at 3D Experience World in Nashville, Tennessee earlier this year. Uh, before we jump into the presentation, I'd like to share just a few things uh, with you about me and my professional career. Uh, I'm a simulation, senior simulation product specialist with CATI. I work out of our Louisville, Kentucky office. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Louisville. Uh, I worked in industry for a little over 15 years in the medical device and also convert commercial beverage equipment industry. Uh, and I've been with a SOLIDWORKS reseller now for close to 10 years. Uh, the company that I was at back in 95 and 96 was an early adopter of SOLIDWORKS uh, and then eventually Cosmos Works. Uh, and yes, that is a picture of me with my actual SOLIDWORKS 95 user's manual. It's only about 80 pages thick. Um, they don't even print them anymore. They would be far, far too thick for print. Uh, aside from that, uh, I'm a dad, I'm a golf junkie, I drink more coffee than I should. Uh, living in Kentucky, of course, I consume my fair share of bourbon. Uh, and I consider myself a computer nerd and a problem solver, uh, to say the least. Um, I'm also a big fan of the University of Louisville Cardinal sports teams. All right, so uh, the three key takeaways that everyone should have at the end of this presentation are using design studies to help automate some of your analysis work, uh, also using a methodical approach for using FEA as a comparison tool, and then finally, a, a deeper understanding of what topology studies are with SOLIDWORKS simulation. All right, so how we're going to get to those three takeaways is through this agenda. So fairly simple, we're gonna start with a CAD model of a suspension assembly and work through a process to improve the design. Then we're gonna work through a significant data gathering exercise to prepare for doing our topology study. And then finally, we'll actually get into setting up and solving the topology study. So let's start with the design studies. Uh, the steps on screen are the process that we're going to go through and investigate and make changes to the design. Now this CAD model comes from a SOLIDWORKS simulation training course and it's pictured in the upper right hand corner. It's a scaled model of a suspension assembly. Now the CAD files have been simplified so we can work through our FEA studies faster. It just means I've removed some details, small features and things uh, to make things mesh and solve quickly. Uh, we've conducted some physical tests to gather the loading that acts on the knuckle uh, of this assembly. So we're going to create a linear static finite element model and solve it based on those loads. Uh, we're going to use a design study to investigate the four loading conditions and determine what the worst case loading is and come up with a best design. Uh, then we're going to use another design study to come up with an, a, a best thickness of the lower A arm. And ultimately, the, the whole reason we're doing this is we want that lower A arm to meet our design requirements or this full assembly to have a factor of safety of 1.3 or greater. So here's the suspension assembly in SOLIDWORKS CAD. Uh, I already have my simulation turned on, so I'm going to walk you through the setup and solution of the suspension. Uh, the first step is, of course, to create a linear static study, and you can see those tabs on the bottom. Uh, those are my FEA study tabs and also my design study tabs. Now, materials have already been assigned to each part in their respective CAD models, so I'm going to leave those as is for the FEA studies. The fixtures are five fixed hinges where the suspension is connected to the rest of the vehicle. And a fixed hinge allows only rotation about its axis of re revolution. All other degrees of freedom are restrained. And for the initial FEA study, I'm going to apply a force acting out on the, the knuckle. Uh, from the test data, I know there's a combination of unique load cases that act on the knuckle, one vertically and one horizontally. And I'm going to set these to one newton each for now because I'm not yet concerned about the magnitude for matching my test data. To reduce the number of parts in the analysis, the CAD models of pins are going to be replaced with virtual connectors. Now the first three pins may be obvious. Two of them are going to connect the knuckle to the upper and lower A arm, and one of them connects the lower A arm to the shock. And one thing to note, these pin connectors are in double shear. 
If you're using SOLIDWORKS Simulation 2017 or older, this would require one pin connector for each of the pairs of cylindrical faces. Now the last pin is interesting. The method of keeping the shock plunger associated with the shock body is a virtual connector. This is going to allow these bodies to both translate and rotate in 3D space as the suspension assembly is loaded or unloaded. I can't accomplish uh, that connection between the shock plunger and shock body with the restraint. Like the pins we discussed earlier, I don't want to include the CAD model for a spring for several reasons. First, it might be difficult to mesh. Uh, second, the real spring needs to have a preload, uh, which is generated by either compression or extension of the spring. And I can't easily accomplish that in a linear static analysis with a physical CAD model. Uh, also, the CAD model, uh, to accommodate the preload, would have to be compressed like the real spring would see in the actual assembly. Uh, third, an actual spring in the finite element model would introduce uh, several contact conditions between itself and other bodies, which is going to increase the complexity of the analysis and increase the solution time. The biggest thing with FEA is I want my studies to solve quickly so I can get through more iterations and still make sound design decisions. So we'll replace the, the actual spring body with a virtual spring. Next, there are several regions on the lower A arm and the shock plunger that we're interested in. It could be that from our experience in designing suspensions, we know these reasons are in the primary load path, or maybe a more experienced engineer told us that adding additional elements in these regions would be a smart thing to do. Either way, we're going to add mesh controls to everything highlighted so more elements are created in the FEA mesh on those highlighted regions. Now that I've completed my initial FEA study setup, it's time to start on the, the big problem of determining the worst case loading. But before I get too much further along, it's important to, uh, to point out that doing good analysis is going to take time. So diligence in setting up the finite element model to replicate physical testing conditions is going to be important. Now I've solved this model with my unit loads applied to the knuckle. And at this point, I'm really not interested in the results. The only thing that I'm interested in is that my FEA study is going to run to completion without errors. Once I know this, then I'm ready to dig into the big problem of determining my worst load case conditions. All right. So to automate our FEA work and determine the worst case loading, I'm going to start by creating parameters. Now, parameters can be found on the Evaluate Command Manager tab by clicking on that small down arrow underneath Design Study. A parameter is the what you want to change in an FEA study. In this case, I want to change the magnitude of both the lateral and vertical loads that act on the knuckle of the suspension assembly. So I'm going to create a named parameter for each and link it back to my FEA study. The second step of the design study is to create sensors for tracking information as the design study is being solved. All right. I've created sensors to, tra to track several key outputs from my FEA study, such as maximum von Mises stress, maximum displacement, minimum factor of safety in the suspension assembly. Now, a little side note here. If you're not familiar with sensors in SOLIDWORKS, I highly recommend searching through the help files to learn more. And with the sensors created, I set up the design study. This includes creating the four loading scenarios that the suspension design will experience. These come from the parameters I had previously created. The second thing to set up is the constraints of the suspension design. Now, I'm not actually constraining anything. Rather, I'm using the sensors just for tracking the data from the FEA study. Now, I'm going to solve this design study using the four unique loading conditions and then review the data from the sensors. Now, it may be a little bit difficult to scan through that full table at the bottom of the screen, so I'm going to make it a little bit easier and blow it up. Just looking at the row of data for the minimum factor of safety, it's apparent that scenario four is my worst case loading of the suspension. So because the, uh, or, <clears throat> excuse me, because it has the lowest factor of safety equal to 0 0.98, that's what I'm going to focus on for making changes as I progress through this design. All right. So now we need to improve the design by changing something about the lower A arm. So it was decided that if the thickness of the lower A arm is increased, it's going to make the design better. Back to parameters. 
I'm going to create a new parameter for changing the thickness dimension of the lower A arm. This will, of course, be used in a new design study. But at this point, the only thing I know is that I want to change the thickness of the lower A arm. I'm going to use a design study, a new design study, to figure out how thick that part should be. So my next step, of course, is creating another design, creating another design study and setting up those same scenarios with a lower A arm thickness. All right. Since I've already uh, have the sensors in place from the model, I'm going to reuse those in tracking the same information from this second design study. All right, so I don't have to recreate the wheel. I've already got that in place. I'm just going to reuse it. Then I'm going to solve this second design study, varying the lower A arm thickness, and look at a table of results. The stress values and locations probably look good, but which scenario is the best one? Well, to do this, I'm going to create a plot to track factor of safety for each of the tested scenarios. Where you see set one in that chart, that corresponds to the minimum thickness I specified in my design study, two and a half millimeters. Each scenario, or each set, adds half a millimeter to the lower A arm thickness. You can see that once I get to set four, that's a four millimeter thick lower A arm, increasing the thickness does not significantly improve the minimum factor of safety. So based upon this chart, I can determine that a four millimeter thick scaled model of my lower A arm is my best design option. Now before I go too much further, if you're not familiar with design studies, there are a few resources you could consult. Uh, the first is there are built-in tutorials that are installed on your local workstation with SOLIDWORKS. Take a look at those. The second are the online help files for SOLIDWORKS. In that short list, gives you a few ideas of words to query so you can learn about different aspects of design studies. You can also search for YouTube videos or read blogs like CATI's technical blog for information about simulation and other topics. Finally, you can always attend a training class with us. We go over design studies in the three-day simulation class and also in the two-day simulation professional class. To wrap up on using design studies to automate analysis work, here are the things that I covered. We used a simplified version of the CAD geometry for the FEA work. I created an initial finite element model just to make sure I could get the FEA study to solve to completion. Then I used a design study to perform repetitive FEA work, like investigating different loading to find the worst case scenario, or changing model dimensions to identify the best design based on the what I changed of that specific design. And ultimately, all of that work led to me meeting a factor of safety of 1.3 or greater for my suspension assembly. So considering, uh, or consider the following questions. We'll do a little post-mortem here. Was the design study approach effective? Well, sure, I got to my factor of safety, right? Uh, is my suspension design acceptable? Well, based on my FEA, everything looks like it worked, and I still met my factor of safety. But could the design have been better? Well, probably. I only changed one model dimension on the lower A arm to improve it. But did I change the right thing? Well, there I would have to say maybe. Uh, I went from a factor of safety less than 1 to a factor of safety greater than 1.3, so it worked. But then did I limit my creativity? Well, again, maybe. I only focused on changing one thing. What else might I, might I have been able to change about my design for the lower A arm, maybe the knuckle, maybe the shock? A whole lot of questions that I would have moving forward. So that wraps up the first topic, design studies and automating finite element analysis. Now it's time to shift gears to the second topic, which is topology study, preparation, and comparative FEA work. Recall that the suspension assembly I started with had been simplified so those design studies would solve quickly. The next steps in progressing the design are to re-add those details I previously omitted and re-verify the design with FEA. Here I have unsuppressed fillets on the lower A arm, added in some additional details, and then resolved the analysis. The maximum stress is still in roughly the same location. The boss is where the lower A arm is pin connected to the shock plunger. The other thing to note is the maximum von Mises stress for this more featured design has been reduced by about 15%, which benefits our final design. We have a better factor of safety than 1.3. And here's what the final lower A arm design looked like. 
It's the fully featured CAD model. It also has some split lines on it because I know that's where the pins are going to be pushed in. Maybe I've added those for some detailing work on my, uh, my drawings. It's important to note that this scaled lower A arm has a mass of just under 111 grams. We're going to need this data later on when we get to our topology studies. Now, how do you think about your design work today? I would bet it includes some or all of the items listed on screen. This is how we build parts. We create sketches. We add dimensions and sketch relations. We use those to build features. And we add more sketches, more references, more features, rinse and repeat until we come up with our finished design. Now, this process is not going to go away anytime soon. We're still going to have SOLIDWORKS parametric CAD. But what if we don't limit our designs to CAD features? So here's the scenario. I finished my suspension assembly using the design studies. The lower A arm was modified to meet my worst case loading scenario, and I achieved this factor of safety of 1.3 or better, and that lower A arm scaled model has a mass of 111 grams. Now I've been asked to come up with a design that reduces the mass of the lower A arm, not just remove a little bit of mass either. Can I reduce the mass of the lower A arm design by one third, 33%? What features could I change? Where do I start? So then I read about topology studies, which were introduced with SOLIDWORKS Simulation Professional and SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium in 2018. So of course, the first thing I'm going to do is try and do a topology study on my assembly. Right? But I'm immediately met with this message. I can use a topology study to create the best shape for a part. And I have to select that part to shape optimize. But not all of the loads and fixtures are applied directly to the lower A arm. The load path goes through other parts in the assembly. All right. So this is what I would see. Can't use my assembly. So I cannot jump right into a topology study. So I think it's probably a good time to review what a topology study is and it will do for us. We're going to use topology studies to explore design iterations to satisfy optimization goals and geometric constraints. Now, this is a non-parametric optimization of just parts. But what does that mean? It means we're focusing on a final shape of a part, not constrained with features. It also begins with the maximum design space of a part, which we'll get to that in just a second. It also takes into account the loads, fixtures, and manufacturing constraints. And ultimately, we want to come up with some optimized component that satisfies all of our manufacturing and mechanical requirements. Right. So while I think I know what each of those points mean, I'm going to focus on the third and fourth, fourth points. What is a maximum design space for a part? And how do I get the loads that act on the part that I want to optimize when that component is part of a larger assembly? All right, so this video will show the creation of the maximum design space part. This means that the component I want to optimize needs to be as large as possible at the beginning of the topology study. It should act, occupy the maximum volume that is still fully functional in the context of the assembly. Well, why? Because SOLIDWORKS Simulation's topology study is a subtractive optimization, not an additive optimization. Now, I don't know what the final shape of the topology optimized part is going to look like, but I do know that it resides somewhere within that full volume of the lower A arm. So here's a comparison of the maximum design space part to the current best lower A arm. As you can see, there's a lot of commonality between the parts. The connections from the lower A arm to the knuckle and the shock are unchanged. But this maximum design space is much larger and uh, has a lot more mass than uh, my current best design. This is where I'm going to start for the lower A arm shape optimization. Also, once I've created the maximum design space part, I can use another analysis tool such as SOLIDWORKS Motion to verify that the maximum design space component is still fully functional in the context of the entire assembly. Here I'm making sure that I don't have any interferences that occur when the suspension goes through its full range of motion. And that's going to be important for the start of my maximum design space part. That takes care of building the maximum design space part. 
Now, how do I use my knowledge of the suspension assembly and the FEA studies I've used to find the loads and fixtures that act on this part? Recall this message that I showed earlier. Topology studies are part-only analysis, so I need to generate the data to support this fourth bullet point. So this is where I'm going to start for SOLIDWORKS simulation in my FEA studies that uh, compared results from one study to another. I've used this assembly successfully up to this point, so I'm going to continue using it as a data gathering model. The fixtures and loads that act on the lower A arm in this full assembly need to be the same fixtures and loads that I apply to this maximum design space part so I can have a successful topology study. So back to the finite element model of the full suspension assembly for my worst case loading. In FEA, the primary unknown of analysis are the displacements. So I can set up additional sensors to gather the data of the X, Y, and Z displacements of, say, the cylindrical face that connects the pin to the knuckle. That should be actually the, the pinned face that connects the lower A arm to the knuckle. And since I already have a finite element model and design studies for the suspension assembly, I can reuse that design study or maybe create a new one and just build some additional sensors for gathering that information. So here's my new design study, and I'm using sensors to track the displacement in X, Y, and Z of that main pin cylindrical face. And then this is what the table of solved results look like. Now I've included the original uh, four scenarios, but I'm really only concerned about scenario four at this point. So the interesting things to note here are maximum stress is around 400 megapascals, and I get the data that I need for doing a part FEA study. So that main pin dash UX, that's a sensor tracking the X displacement of that pin face, same with main pin UY and main pin UZ. So of course my next step is to set up a new FEA study on the maximum design space lower A arm. I'm going to use the same fixed hinges on the two cylindrical faces that I did before. And I'll use the X, Y, and Z displacement data from this design study that we just finished to apply a prescribed displacement to the ID face where the pin connects the lower A arm to the knuckle. Here you can already see the results of that FEA study. Now, I expected the maximum von Mises stress to be around 400 megapascal, but in this study, the maximum stress is over 16,000. And the maximum stress is at the prescribed displacement face and not on a region near the pin that connects the lower A arm to the shock. In the assembly, this face both translates and rotates under the applied loads and connections. But in this new part FEA study, the face just translates. So this is causing faulty stress results. This is a clear indication that I cannot use displacement data as a, quote, load for my topology study. So back to the original suspension model and FEA studies. What if I gather the forces acting on the pinned faces of the lower A arm? I already know the FEA model is correct, and I have a significant amount of experience with this design, so I'm just going to create more sensors for data gathering. Now, when I create these sensors, I'm also going to name them. And that way, uh, in giving them a descriptive name, it's going to help me track uh, the data that I'm generating from additional design studies and make it easier from going from the assembly analysis to the part analysis. The main pin is the same as before, but I'm going to consider the left and right for the two pins connecting the lower A arm to the shock is if I'm sitting in the vehicle left side of the screen, and looking out towards the knuckle, the right side of the screen. Hey, Bill. Yes, sir. This is Bob. Um, I had a question come over from Adam. It says, so we're tracking the displacement of the lower A arm in order to use those as input to the topology study for the lower arm? Well, right now what I'm doing is I'm trying to come up with a method to correlate the analysis results from the assembly to analysis results from the part, so I can do the topology study. Okay, excellent, thank you. All right. So, let's go back here. All right, so here's the updated design study, and it shows the results from my original scenario four on screen. That was the worst case loading. But I also took this one step further. 
I've been focusing on the four loading scenarios uh, that was part of my original design study at the beginning. And I got curious to see what the effects of the lateral and vertical loading were. So I added three additional scenarios. Scenario five has a near zero vertical loading. Scenario six has a near zero lateral loading. And then scenario seven uses the maximum lateral and maximum vertical load. Well, why did I do this? I've been focusing on what happens to the suspension assembly for the four original loads that I, I really needed to step back and question, well, why was I using just scenario four? I mean, if you look at the table, scenario three has a lateral loading that's more than double either scenarios two, three, or four. So it's just kind of an additional data gathering exercise. All right, so I'm nearly ready for the topology study. And honestly, the whole reason I did this is kind of to determine, well, what should I really use when I'm focusing on my topology study? And as you can see, if I just use scenario seven, well, the lateral loading, while it affects my design, isn't really the, the primary issue. So I'm just going to create a single loading for the topology study and use scenario seven, which is just maximum lateral and maximum vertical load. All right, so back to the FEA study of the maximum design space part. With this new data gathered, I need to set up the forces acting in X, Y, and Z of those pin faces. So one thing that I should mention here is load orientation. The primary axes of the lower A arm and the part file may not be exactly the same as the primary axes of this part when it's used in the assembly. So for this model, I made sure to orient the part in exactly the same position as the full assembly suspension model. So even though I'm doing a topology study, uh, this is actually on an assembly file. If you look up towards the, the file name, it was just so that I could put this part in the context of assembly and get the orientation correct. That means my X, Y, and Z axes of this part topology study, even though it's an assembly, match the top level. Now, if I didn't take this additional orientation step, the loads from the top level assembly would not match when I go to the part. So I've solved this FEA study with the loads acting on the three pin faces. Now, it did solve the with warnings. Right. Uh, so here's the warning. It says model is unstable. Maybe I don't have adequate fixtures. The other thing to note is what's the magnitude of displacements? 47,000 millimeters. Now that's clearly not correct. The maximum displacement of my original lower A arm was approximately 15 millimeters. So it can't be 47,000. So to get past this instability, I'm going to turn on an option called inertial relief in my study properties and resolve the analysis. Now, the reason I'm using this is even though the forces acting on the three faces should have balanced the part, mathematically, if there's a small rounding error, that could be enough to cause the finite element model instability. On a side note, using inertial relief is one of the ways that we use um, motion study data for solving finite element models on parts from motion studies. So I'm going to resolve my finite element study with the inertial relief option, and then these are the results. The maximum stress is very low. It's 40 megapascals. Now, I actually expected this because the loads are now distributed through a much, much larger lower A arm. The nice thing is the location of stress is in the region that I expected. It's near the bosses. Um, on the, call it the outside of that lower A arm, where the lower A arm is connected to the shock via the pin. So the maximum displacement is much closer to what I achieved with the original lower A arm design, seven and a half millimeters, and my stress results, albeit low, are in the correct location. So if you're still following me in my thought process, the previous 15 slides and discussion was all about obtaining the correct loads and fixtures to apply to the lower A arm part, because those loads are actually transferred through an assembly. Call it prep work for my topology study. To wrap up this section of the agenda, here's what we discussed. We created a maximum design space part. I had multiple revisits to my, call it, original design study, gathering data for use in my topology study. And then I used a comparative FEA process for verifying that my part-only FEA matched my full assembly FEA. And then, of course, troubleshoot some instability in the part-only finite element model.
now we're ready to talk about successful topology studies. So hopefully you're still following along. All right, so I'm going to use the same CAD file that I did for the part-only FEA. I don't want to recreate this additional work after all the steps I've previously done. So here I'm going to copy the existing linear static model and convert it to a topology study. In doing this, the fixtures and loads that I've already spent a lot of time in setup and verification are duplicated, and this is going to save me a little bit of time because I've taken so much time just to get to this point. All right, now for topology studies. What does it take to be successful with topology studies? I've used multiple loading scenarios on the suspension design and the same part-only FEA to match the part-only to uh, part-only FEA for the lower A-arm to the lower A-arm in the assembly. And with topology studies, I do have the option of using the load case manager and having multiple iterations of a shape-optimized part created but I'm just going to simplify my final topology study to just use the loads from Scenario 7 instead of using individually, say, Scenarios 1, 2, 3, and 4. Also, with a topology study, I need to consider what my goals are. I'm going to choose the option Best Stiffness to Weight Ratio, but what should that goal be? So let's compare my previous best lower A-arm design and the maximum design space lower A-arm. Recall that I asked a what-if question earlier. What if I reduce the mass of the lower A-arm by one-third, but which mass to use for that goal? If I use, say, 35% of the mass of the current lower A-arm, that's 72 grams, but I need to use an 80% reduction of the maximum design space part to achieve a 72-gram topology-optimized body. So we're going to call that a big stretch goal. Manufacturing controls. I have several options to help guide the topology study in finding the optimum shape. I'm going to set up a few on this part. I'm going to specify a minimum thickness of 2.1 millimeters. Also, I want to be able to use the shaped optimized lower A arm on both the left and right side of my vehicle. So even though the loading conditions are not symmetric, I want the final design to be symmetric. So I'm going to set up this model as a half symmetry model. I'm also going to set up a manufacturing control called a preserved region. In the full assembly, there's going to be pins connecting the lower A arm to the vehicle, to the shock, and to the knuckle. This is going to ensure that I have adequate material thickness around these connection points in my final topology design. Note that I'm specifying 2.1 millimeters here for my scaled model. There is also a topology study option to preserve material at the loads and fixtures, though note this does not include specifying a minimum material thickness. All right, so I'm going to use the 2.1 millimeters uh, preserved region rather than this specific option here. Now, a topology study does have a finite element mesh, and using the correct settings and solver is important. So the first is it is recommended that we use draft quality elements uh, or a first order tetrahedra elements for topology studies. Now this is going to generate a linear response for the elements. It's also going to help topology studies solve faster. Again, displacements are my primary unknown for FEA, so we want to use draft quality elements here. Second, recall I specified a 2.1 millimeter preserved region. I want to have at least three elements through the thickness of any preserved region, so I'm going to set my global mesh size at 0.7 millimeters. Going into the topology study properties, I also want to make sure that I turn off automatic solver selection and specify the Intel Direct Solver. That is the solver to use when you're working with topology studies. So, with those four bullet points addressed, I can now solve the topology study. The output of a topology study is the best shape that meets all of the requirements, all of the constraints, and all of the loads that we previously discussed. So this is what you would see once a topology study solves to completion. Now I've made a few changes to the plot options, like changing the legend from 5 to 10 colors, and I've also used a slider bar when editing this plot to show only the material that absolutely must be kept in the design. Now pay attention to the reported mass of this part. It's only 56 grams and my goal was 72 grams. So in a second, uh, we'll switch to SolidWorks and take a look at some of these settings. <laughs> 
So one of the things that I would do is edit this material mass plot and adjust the slider bar until I see a part mass that equals about 72 grams. Now this adds additional elements back to what you see on screen. Right? So when I'm working in SOLIDWORKS, uh, this is what I'm talking about. All right, so uh, by the way, these take a bit of time to switch between. So this would be the original material mass plot. And the only thing that you see on screen is just the yellow on this part. All right, so this is what my topology optimized shape would look like if I rotate it around. You can see what portions of the model were kept and then which portions of the model were removed. All right, that second plot that I showed you is here in my second material mass plot. So you'll notice it will take a little bit of time to update the graphics for these. And what I meant by doing edit definition to get to that 72 grams is right here. So this slider bar, this ISO value is what you would drag left and right until you see that calculated element mass close to the 72 grams that we were looking for. All right, I also have the chart options for changing the number of colors that I used. And in doing that, that's just going to make each of these segments on the edit definition chart correspond to a band of colors from my legend. Okay. Um, what else can I do? Well, there is also what is called a smooth mesh plot. So this is calculated or generated from the, uh, this material mass plot that you see on screen. And what it's going to do, once the graphics updates, is it's going to take and build a smooth surface, or as smooth as possible, from all of the element volumes that you still see on the screen. And it kind of looks like this. Now the last thing I'm going to take a look at for the topology study is there is some underlying FEA data that was used for generating this shape optimized part. So once the study is created, I can take a look at the von Mises stress plot. All right, so here I can see where the regions of high stress are acting on the model. And anywhere that you see positive values of stress, or basically something outside of that deep blue band, that's where I'm going to keep geometry in the shape optimized part. And I could also take a look at my topology study results and see what the displacements are uh, from this final design. So it says in this particular case, my maximum displacement is going to go up to around 16.7 millimeters. All right, so back to my PowerPoint. Uh, the last output that I mentioned was the smooth mesh model, and this is created from the material mass plot. Now, um, as you hopefully saw, these plots can take um, several minutes or several seconds to a couple of minutes to recreate in SOLIDWORKS. A um, little thing to note, the reason they didn't take so long on my screen is I had already loaded in this data and switched between the plots. So that did speed up things for this presentation. Now, what can you do with this part? Well, many things. Uh, I could export it to an STL file and 3D print it. I could also export it to a mesh body file and then use it as a guideline uh, to remodel the lower A arm with sketches and features and you name it, to try and match the general shape of my topology optimized part. All right, so it's really up to you to decide what you want to do once you have this final geometry that you see on screen. So wrapping up successful topology studies, I discussed my thought process on using a single loading condition. I made decisions on manufacturing controls, optimization goals, and constraints. I made sure to use a draft quality mesh with an appropriate element size to have at least three elements across any preserved region. And I made sure to use the Intel Direct Spar Solver. And then finally, we took a quick look at some topology study results, uh, material mass plots, smooth mesh plot, and then the underlying uh, stress and displacement plots. So that wraps up the agenda for topology studies, solving big problems one step at a time. But you probably have some questions, and thank you for the one that came in. Um, but I'm going to ask a couple of you. Uh, so while you're typing in your questions, how soon uh, will it be before you attempt to solve a topology study? 
Also, um, you might be curious, how long does it take to solve a topology study? Well, for this particular model that I worked on, the mesh had approximately 127,500 nodes and 694,000 degrees of freedom. Now, I have a dedicated tower workstation with an 8-core i7 CPU uh, to solve this model. On that machine, it took 52 minutes. That was with the 0.7 millimeter mesh control. If you wanted the results to be more refined, you'd have to use a much smaller mesh, so maybe a half of a millimeter, maybe 0.35 millimeters, or even half the size of what I used. That's going to take significantly longer. And then the third question to ponder is, do you think a topology study with SOLIDWORKS simulation is going to meet your non-parametric design needs? Thanks, everyone, for attending, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.